So uh, I'm talking about uh, fitting generalized linear models to moderately large data sets. Uh, following what I'm told is best practice, there's a nice short URL for you to look up. So when I'm not at USAR, I'm telling people that computation is a lot more important than they think it is and they shouldn't just sort of dismiss it. When I am at USAR, I'm going to be telling people that theory is more important than they think it is and they shouldn't just dismiss it. So here we're going to be talking about fitting models to reasonably large data sets, not sort of big data in capital letters, but you know, millions to billions of observations. Uh, examples, there's the famous New York taxi trips data set that got foiled in um, New York and has been used for all sorts of interesting analyses. I'll be showing you some data from the New Zealand Vehicle Registry. Uh, more seriously, the American Community Survey samples 2% of the American population every year and that adds up fairly quickly. So how do we fit generalized linear models to data that's inconveniently large for a, a little, cute little laptop? Well, one approach is to read the data in chunks. So you read the first 1,000 observations or 10,000 observations, process them, read the next 10,000 observations, and so on. And then you'll have to do that iteratively. That's what big GLM in the big LM package does. You could do all the computations in a database, so Fei Chen and Brian Ripley at an early version of a conference like this talked about an approach to using the conjugate gradient optimization algorithm with all the data in Postgres. Or you could just split the data into random chunks, fit the model to each chunk and average the results, the divide and recombine approach. Um, the you probably recognize the senior author on that paper, Bill Cleveland. Now, the first two of these approaches make multiple passes over the whole data set. If you're doing, say, five iterations, you look at all the data five times, which is, you know, not ideal. Also, the first and last of those, all the data has to come into memory from wherever it lives. And again, that's not ideal if you've got moderately large data. So what I'm going to, what I'm proposing here is a, using a one-step Fisher scoring update. So you've got a starting value, beta twiddle, and you do a one, one iteration of Fisher scoring, which involves computing the uh, score vector and the information and then using them to create an update. We know that Fisher scoring converges quadratically. The number of accurate digits doubles with each iteration once you get close enough. And so that means that if the starting value beta twiddle is close enough, one iteration gives you an estimate that's just as good as iterating all the way to convergence. Lots of people know that root n consistent is good enough for that starting point. Fewer people know that you only need to do better than fourth root of n. And the reason fewer people know is that this is largely a completely useless fact, because if you can get fourth root n convergence, you can get root n convergence. The reason it's useful is that you can get fourth root n convergence just by using a small subsample. Uh, also note, I, you don't need to compute the full information matrix. You can just rescale the one you got from the subsample. Um, okay. So what we're going to do is start with reading a random sample of size small n into memory, use the GLM function to fit the G model to it, and then uh, do a one step up, then we want to do a one step update. Now, if the small sample is bigger than the square root of the size of the large sample, then that's going to be good enough. So if the large sample is a billion, the small sample can be 100,000, which is quite manageable. If the large sample is 100 billion, the small sample can be 130,000, which again is quite manageable. We still need to do the update using all the data but the update in a GLM is just a sum of products 
plus a little bit of other computation to get the fitted mean. And we can do this in SQL. So if we you can write um, complicated SQL statements to compute the W and mu, and then the score is just a sum of products. And the complicated functions aren't that complicated. For the most common generalized linear models, that W is just one. And the mu is not very hard. It's the linear predictor with the transformation. So it's not that hard in R to write code that will write SQL to compute that update. You've still got the problem that databases, databases, standards are wonderful, so every database has one of their own. Uh, and so we need, it would be nice to have some way to paper over that. And so we're going to, I'm going to be using dbplyr rather than explicit SQL and uh, the new tidy predict package to construct the fitted means. Unfortunately, this means that you have code that looks like that in your uh, package. Uh, the tidyverse is very nice from the point of view of the user, slightly less nice from the point of view of the implementer. So we've got tidy to predict to compute the fitted values, uh, define the variables for the score vector, take the mean of each one, and then actually do it. All the previous steps of building up a great big huge SQL statement that you finally send off for computation. So here's the uh, data analysis. Our red car's faster. So we've got the New Zealand fleet, vehicle fleet database. So that's all motor vehicles in New Zealand, whether they're currently registered or not. It's about five and a half million of them. There's a bit of data cleaning required. <laughs> but... Um, we can do that. We have the technology. And, and we end up with about 1.7 million sort of apparently OK records for passenger cars or vans. Go to fit a logistic regression. Is red, binary outcome, depending on the engine power, the number of seats, and the mass of the vehicle. And it turns out that red cars, the cars with higher power, lower mass, and fewer seats are more likely to be red. So red cars do go faster. <laughs> so how do we do, how does the timing work? Well, we've got, using this dbglm package, it takes about 1.3 seconds with MonADB Lite as the database interface. If you don't know MonADB Lite and you do largish scale computing, you should look it up. It's uh, fast for scientific, optimized for scientific computing. 3.1 seconds with SQLite, which is optimized to being small and simple. In this case, we could read the whole data set into memory, even on my laptop, and it takes about seven or eight seconds. That's not counting the time to read the data in. Or we could read the data in chunks with the big LM package, and that's even slower. That does scale to arbitrarily big data sets, but it's slower. Primarily because it has to do multiple iterations, whereas dbglm only does one. You'd also worry about whether the accuracy is good enough. I mean, you know, asymptotics, you know, this is all this infinite hand wavy stuff. Does it actually work in reasonable data sets? And so here we've got a graph. These are rescaled confidence intervals for each parameter in the model. If you had the maximum likelihood estimator in its confidence interval, the point estimate would be at exactly zero on the, dotted li on the solid line, and the interval would go from exactly minus one to plus one. These are three replicates with different starting, random starting subsets, and you can see that the point estimates are pretty much at zero, and the confidence intervals go pretty much from minus one to one. So we are getting a good enough match to what we'd get with a full, full maximum likelihood estimation. And this is a smallish data set for this method. This data set is so small, you could just read it all into memory and run GLM on it. 
And the quality of the approximation should improve the larger the data set gets. So what have we got? The subsampling, which gives a good enough starting value for one step GLM fitting to work. Now, there's only some models where that's going to be true. There's, some, there's a complicated paper in the Scandinavian Journal of Statistics which works out for a wide range of parametric and semi-parametric models what's the minimum number of iterations you need in principle to get efficient estimation. Um, if you feel like reading that, uh, you're welcome to. Um, I, most, I only read bits of it. But for GLMs, one step is fine. The databases can do the update calculations almost portably. So two cheers for databases. Mathematical statistics. So this is a case where asymptotics actually tells you something useful uh, and exploited, practically exploitable about the behavior of moderately large data sets. So sort of two cheers for mathematical statistics. And the tidyverse lets you implement this uh, papering over the difference between different database backends. So I've tried it on SQLite and MonoDB, and it should work on Google BigQuery or Postgres or whatever. Uh, and it's a bit of a pain to implement, but, you know, it works. So sort of two cheers for the tidyverse as well. Thank you. Ahead of time, okay, I'm Thomas is, is quite ahead of time, so I want some really hard questions for him so that we stay closer to schedule. Oh dear. Or just really long comments. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, mixed effects models. So you're going to. The problem with mixed effects models is that you can't. It depends on whether you're interested in estimating the random effects or just the variance components. If you're estimate, interested in estimating the random effects, then you can't do it without sampling from every random effect, and so you can't do this. If you're just interested in estimating the variance components, so the, the sort of parameters of the variance distribution, and the, then, you, then it should work. You should be able to take the random subsample um, you're, you may need to, so the other tricky thing is that if you take, suppose you had, um, spa say, spatial, spatially clustered data and you're fitting a mixed model like that, if you just took a small random subsample, you'd end up sampling no pairs of points that were close enough to estimate variances. So you'd need to do the sampling in a way that let you capture the variance components. But otherwise, it should work that um, we've got, uh, you know, you can write down what the Fisher scoring updates are, even though Doug Bates doesn't do it that way, you can write them down. Um, he does penalize, I mean, he does something that involves estimating the random effects, but you could do it. And so it would work, but you'd have to be careful about the sampling. Uh, so what would happen if we might happen if we had really fat-tailed data? Well, um, for a binary outcome, that's just not going to happen. Um, it, so it would depend on the model. Some, if you had, you'd have, if your response variable was really fat-tailed, then you'd need to be using a. GLM family that accounted for that, and then you'd be okay. If you were doing something where, if it was your X's that were really long-tailed, then, so say you were fitting, say, Poisson regression and your X's were really long-tailed, then you might end up with, um, 
it's also going to depend on whether the X outliers really follow the model or not. If they really follow the model, you're probably okay. If they really don't, if they're sort of errors, then you might be in trouble and you might need ridiculously large data for it to work. You, could prob you can always take a larger subsample. So, you know, n to the five ninths is a sort of minimal one. You could, if you could afford it, you could take a larger subsample that's still much smaller than the whole data set, and that would help. Yeah. One more? <clears throat> really hypothetical question, but if you have a large data set, say, of observations of Australian animals, and <laughs> <laughs> you want to throw that into a database, uh, is SQL white? I would say that if it's large, you'd be better off with MonoDB Lite rather than SQLite. MonoDB Lite is also a no configuration embeddable one like SQLite, which, but it's optimized for scientific computing, whereas SQLite is optimized, well, it's small, and it's designed for ordinary database row operations. So if you want to do statistical computing with a database, I'd suggest MonoDB Lite rather than SQLite, but the, they, they are both, SQLite is more tolerant about departures from standard SQL, but it does speak standard SQL. And so um, it depends on what you want to do. Just putting stuff into a database, you can just read in bulk CSV or whatever, and that will, that will get you a setup, though it's not the most efficient way to do it. If you want to do computing in the direct database, then you probably want to think about using dbplyr for it because that captures most of what SQL can do and it gives you a fairly well implemented um, interface that's portable across databases. All right, well, I want to thank you for your meaty questions. Let's thank Thomas one more time.